he expressed appreciation for that, which surprised me. Um, we just sort of picked up from there and began talking again. Just talking mean dating? No, not yet. Recess. Ladies and gentlemen, please be back in the designated area at 320. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. All rise for the jury. I think I speak for both of us when I say sincerely that we hope the jury enjoyed their green beans. Oh, yeah. Please be seated. The presence of the jury the defendant and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for the delay. There was a computer issue and it resulted in us needing to substitute court reporters. You may continue, Mr. Nermal. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Arias, before we took a break, I believe we were talking about the point in time in your life when you got back together with Bobby Juarez. Yes. And from what I understood earlier, you were about 17 years of age when that took place, is that right? Yes. Okay. And you were talking about how you, uh, he had called you, responded to your initial phone contact. Um, tell us how the relationship progressed from him making telephone contact with you. Um, well, at the time, at the time I had a boyfriend. He lived in another country, um, so we corresponded. Um, so it wasn't a romantic reason. Like I had said, I reached out to him for a spiritual reason. Um, I don't know if he was seeing anybody at that time. I don't think he was. Um, he used to call a party line a lot and meet people on that. I guess this was before the internet was really, you know, in every single home. Let, um, let, me, uh, let me interrupt you a little bit there on a couple of different things. Um, you said he made contact on a party line. What's, what is that? Can you describe that for us? From my understanding, I didn't talk on it, but from my understanding, it was a 900 number um, that you could call, and it's like a chat room, but it's on the telephone instead of on the, on the computer. And you chatted to Bobby that way? Or he I didn't. He chatted with other people that okay. way. And you also mentioned, and I don't want to be too far from it, you mentioned that when he made this contact uh, with you, uh, after the contact he made for what you described as spiritual reasons, you said that you had a boyfriend in another country, right? Yes. Okay. And what was that boyfriend's name? Victor. And did Victor have a last name? Arius, ironically. I'm sorry, what? His last name was also Arius. Okay. Just think. If she'd have married that dude instead of getting all stabby with Travis, she'd have saved herself a fortune and a lot of time on changing her name and all the forms and stuff like that. Yeah, that's true. And uh, where did you meet Victor Arias? Um, the summer that I turned 17, right before I turned 17 in July, I flew to Costa Rica on an exchange program and I spent three weeks there with a family. Um, their name was also Arius, and they had um, two sons and two daughters in that family, and the oldest son was just a little older than me, and so we kind of clicked and got to know each other and sort of had a little romance kind of blossom thing. I don't know, it was like my first experience of like the warm fuzzy, somebody that I really felt that I cared for. Okay, and... That relationship lasted a few weeks, or tell me how it lasted beyond your being there. Um, it sort of began to um, develop while I was in Costa Rica, and um, I flew back toward the end of, I had my 17th birthday there in that country, and then I flew back at the near the end of July, and um, we corresponded and talked occasionally on the phone through August, and then we flew to the United States. Um, that September and stayed in Reading, which is um, a city about 100 miles south of Wairika. Um, he had some um, people that he knew there. He stayed there about a week, I think, and then stayed at my house for two weeks before flying back. And when, when did he come stay for you for two weeks? When was that? That was early September 1997. 
So this is about the time then that you were uh, close to the time that you were going to you were in contact with Mr. Juarez as well, right? Yes, it was. Um, it was bef just right before that. Okay, and you considered Mr. Arias to be a boyfriend. Yeah, actually he had given me a ring and it was kind of a promise ring like we were going to get married but we weren't officially engaged. So we would talk about children and marriage and he wanted me to come live down there and start a family. Okay. You said it was your first experience of I guess what we call young love, right? Yeah, it was. Okay. I wouldn't say totally in love but it was my first taste of being like, just feeling like <coughs> warm about somebody, if that makes sense. I don't believe her, do you? No, she ain't got a warm bone in her body. No. I'm guessing she probably thinks that she should have been feeling warm and fuzzy. That's probably what was going, but, but she's probably at the time was thinking, why aren't I feeling warm and fuzzy? Because she's a psychopath. Exactly. As it relates to your situation then, uh, Mr... Mr. Arias, Victor, he goes back to Costa Rica, I assume, is that right? Yes. Okay. And then the relationship becomes one probably, what is it, is it primarily of letters, phone calls? Describe that for us. Yeah, um, we wrote a lot. The postman actually got to know my name and face, and he would tease me every time I went to the post office to get it stamped to send to Costa Rica. And I would receive letters from him that were really romantic, and. The Spanish language is very romantic, so he would write things like that, very romantic. Okay, and relative to your age, how old was, was Victor? I don't remember his exact age. I want to say he was about a year older than me. I think, actually, I think we were just, um, we, were, we were very close in age, but he was older than me. Okay. Now, when you started interacting with Mr. Juarez again, We've heard from your earlier testimony that uh, he became your boyfriend at a certain point in time when you were around 17 years old, right? Yes. Okay. Could you just kind of describe for us uh, what happened in that time period uh, when Victor was your boyfriend and then Bobby became your boyfriend? Yes. Um, Bobby and I would talk a few times a week and then it became um, a little more frequent. Um, Victor and I would, um, I couldn't see myself like moving to Costa Rica and having that kind of life and having children with him. Um, we argued like over little silly things. Um, Victor was very jealous and so we would like, I couldn't talk to any of my high school friends that were guys. Um, like I went through the drive through and um, there was a classmate that I had gone to school with uh, two years, you know, over the years, and he had a job there, and um, just, I was driving, of course, because Victor was from out of the country, and we just were there to get ice cream, it was hot, and um, he gave us the ice cream, and we hadn't seen each other all summer, this person that served us, and um, the interaction I had with him, um, Victor didn't like it, so we argued over things like that. Um, when we were in Costa Rica, he wanted me always to walk on the inside of the uh, on the sidewalk away from the street and um, we were at a huge soccer game there. It's, it's a very big deal there. Um, they call it football but it's soccer. Um, and there was actually someone that walked by that looked a lot like Bobby and it kind of reminded me of him at the time. He had long dark curly hair and I, I glanced at him and Victor got upset. Um, Just to let you know we're both still here aren't we? We are at the moment. We haven't passed out with boredom. We haven't fallen asleep yet. We're still here yet and still going strong. We hope you are as well. Yeah. So, things like that, I just didn't see myself being in a marriage with him. So, I broke up with him around October, maybe November, um, 1997, on the phone. On the phone? Yes. Okay. After you broke up with Victor, did you continue seeing Mr. Waters? We weren't really seeing each other, we were just friends at that time, but we continued to talk. Okay. Um, when did the friendship move into something more, to be your boyfriend? 
Um, it was again around New Year's. I think we spent New Year's Eve. Um, I had a car then, so we drove out to um, this little white chapel in, in Little, it's called Little Shasta. It's a tiny, it's even smaller town. I don't even know if it's considered a town. And it's this small white chapel with a tall steeple, and um, there was snow everywhere. And um, we just kind of hung out there and run in the new year, didn't really do it. I, I had developed, began to develop feelings for him right before Christmas, and so I expressed that, and he said he was, he had feelings for me too, and so we decided to give things another try at that point. Okay. And this would have been a few months prior to you moving in with him, is that right? Um, I believe I moved in with him in late April, and so we're around the new year. So four months, four and a half, maybe okay. five. Did your parents, uh, were they aware of your relationship with, and I'm speaking as, as it relates to the, the, the occasion we're talking about now, um, when you're 17 or 18, 17, excuse me. Did they know about your relationship with Mr. Wallace? They knew about it. I don't know how they knew. I wasn't very open with them about my relationships because of prior negative experiences with that, with regard to that. So somehow, I mean, it's a small town. I'm sure people told them they saw us running around or hanging out in the park or just walking around and we hung out. So people would tell my mom and things like that. Did you ever get any indication that your parents approved or disapproved of this relationship? I didn't talk extensively with my dad about it, but my mom didn't like the fact that I was with him because of, she was basing her opinion on him off of rumors she had heard about him. Okay. Now we keep seeing shots of Jody's mom sat in the public gallery and I'm guessing that's um, her twin sister next to her. Yeah, it is. But does her dad ever come? Don't think, I uh, don't know. Not sure. Maybe her dad is too ill. Could be, could she be. did say he was frail. Yeah, said he was quite frail, but um, I just wondered whether he actually ever came to watch her testify. Um, you guys in the, you guys out there, let us know in the comments. Um, when you, when you were, you described it in, in high school how you were working for your father at your father's restaurant, right? Yes. And you were in high school, your junior year. All this was going on at the point in time when you were, uh, began dating Mr. Juarez, right? I think my dad's restaurant closed the year prior when I was still a sophomore. I can't quite remember. No, no, I think it was, he closed that spring. I think he closed that spring in 90, that would have been 98. Okay. I can't remember. It was Did some you, time in high school he closed his restaurant. Okay. Did you work uh, elsewhere after that? Um, Be yes. Before you moved out? Um, did I? Yes. I worked at, briefly as a hostess at a little restaurant called Grandma's House. And during this point in time when you're a 17 year old high school student, Mr. Juarez is, is out of school, are you supplying him with money at this point in time before you've left school? Yes, well, um, he lived with two people he called mom and dad. I think they were his grandparents. Um, Bobby said he was adopted, so his, um, actual his real parents it was kind of I never really met them um, but they we lived he lived with them they would be his mom and dad by definition um, so I think they were just supplying you know clothing and shelter and food and that kind of thing at that point okay so going back to my question were you supplying Mr. Waters with money at this point in time at this point no Then you leave high school and you move in with Mr. Waters, right? Yes, mm -hmm. in the okay. spring. And you mentioned that he was living with persons you believe to be his grandparents, his yes. adopted grandparents. I don't know if they were like really related or if he just called them his parents. Um, but if anything, they were more like his grandparents, but he called them mom and dad. You say that because of their age. Is yeah, they were very much older. Um, I actually saw who everyone around town kind of knew was his mother, but he didn't want anything to do with her, and she was more appropriate age to be his mother. And these people were more like in their 70s, late 70s maybe. Okay. 
Um, when you spoke about your first relationship with Mr. Juarez, you spoke about uh, his desire to move to San Francisco and chase vampires and be with you forever and how he dressed um, in, a, in a gauze style. Uh, was that still, was that 15 year old Bobby the same way he was when you got back together with him? Um, no, he was 20 now. He was a little more mature, but he was still, he still had that eccentricity about him. He had a flair. He, um, for Halloween, he still, he would dress up as um, um, the character played by Brandon Lee from The Crow with the white face and all black leather and all that. So it was a Halloween thing, but he really um, got into that and he did it pretty well, actually. Um, so he still had, he was still drawn to that and part of that was fascinating to me. I thought he was beautiful on the inside and out and I was attracted to him in that regard. And um, But he was a little more down to earth at this point. Earlier you were describing for us a, a situation where you were taking some of your possessions and, and moving it in into Mr. Juarez's home and now eventually you, you moved out. Yes. Okay. Um, what, was, what was the last straw for you to move out of your house? I think the last straw um, was actually when they said you're grounded until you're 18. And I, a lot of my things were already at Bobby's house or his parents' house. Um, they were putting it in a storage shed right behind the house. Um, just boxes of things that I had been saving because I knew I was going to be on my own soon. Um, my dad had recently closed his restaurant. He let me have a lot of the plates, the dishes, the silverware. So um, that would just get me started. So things like that, um, old books I'd already read but didn't want to part with, um, things like that went to the storage shed. And then when I was grounded, I thought, I only have a few more things to throw in the car plus my cat. So I stayed up all night packing while my parents slept. And I, well, my dad, when he would ground me, he used to unhook my car. I don't know what that means, but I would go out and try to turn the engine and it wouldn't turn. He would, he unhooked something under the hood. And I think I, I figured out how to rehook it. So then he started taking the entire piece so that I couldn't rehook it. So the first thing I did um, was I went out after they went to sleep to check if my car would start. And it did. So I was relieved. Um, so I began to load up the car. Um, I was almost completely packed, and then I think around 4.30 or 5, I heard one of my parents um, awake. So I was in the living room, still packing up a few things, and I jumped on the couch real quick to pretend like I was sleeping so they wouldn't wonder why I was awake. And I was very tired, so I ended up falling asleep. And the next thing I knew, it was 7.30 or 7 o'clock, and my mom was in the kitchen preparing breakfast. And I thought, oh shoot, I missed my opportunity. But um, I just went into my bedroom, found my cat, picked her up, and I just started walking out the door. My mom said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. And I just shut the door and got, put my cat in my car and drove out to Bobby's house, unloaded it, and then went to school that day. Right, so we've sat through that, what, five minute long brain fart. And I just want to know what relevance any of that has to this case. It's got nothing to do with the case. It's got nothing to do with the damn trial. She has not described these two ex-boyfriends, Mr. Juarez and Mr. Arias, as being abusive. No, she hasn't. Right. All she's done is um, described how she left home and how she moved in with this Juarez guy and how she was in love at a young age. But this has no bearing on the case, so... It's um, irrelevant. I don't... I mean, Martinez is obviously letting it through, but the... I, I just don't know why we're having to listen to this and why it seems to be a bit of a waste of not just the jury's time, but people in the public gallery, the prosecutors, the judge, everyone's time. Viewers. Yeah. But like you say, they've gotten out. Exactly. And um, you say Bobby's house. Um, these people you describe as, as his grandparents, do they live in this home as well? Yes. And was there anyone else besides them and Bobby in this home? No. Okay. Describe for us the environment you were leaving your home to, leaving your home with your parents uh, in order to live with Bobby. What were you moving to? Um, it was, um, structurally the house was very good, but it was in very bad shape. Um, his parents were um, very heavy smokers, so there was always a haze hanging out in the living room, and there was a lot of um, 
I don't know what it's called, I guess tar or something running down the walls, um, kind of in a deep brown. Um, the living room was um, almost, not quite to the ceiling, but it was packed with a bunch of things. I don't know what it was, just various odds and ends. I guess they were hoarders. Um, Bobby did the best to make his bedroom his own little space. Um, but he wasn't allowed to touch any of those things while they were there. And so, I mean, the kitchen was very, very dirty. Um, the bathroom was very dirty. Um, the, the linoleum was coming off the floor and the shower was kind of falling apart. And um, it was just a mess. All of the, the yard all around the house was overgrown. Um, I went back to my parents' house a few days later to borrow their cleaning supplies for it. That sounds like bloody paradise compared to prison, doesn't it? Doesn't sound like Bobby's house was a, was a, a great place to live. No, he hated it. Um, like I said, his own room, he did his best to make that his space and um, make it habitable. Um, and then his parents would kind of sit in the living room all day and watch TV and smoke till they went to bed. You mentioned uh, he kept his room in a different way. Was that a room you shared with him? Yes. Were you having a sexual relationship with him at that point in time? Um, I'm trying to remember if we were at that point. We did. We did eventually. I don't remember if it was right before I moved in with him. I think it was right after I moved in with him. I can't remember. We, we waited several months. Okay. So. Now look at that guy at the back of uh, Jody's mum to the right. If Stephen Burkoff and Vladimir Putin had a love child, it would be him. From, from what you're telling us then, is that you moved into this home, this, this, this filthy home, with one clean room in it, you dropped out of high school, and you were working, right? He, sorry, will you repeat that? This, at this point in time, when you moved in with Bobby, you were at the end of your junior year, and that was your last... Story, yes, I was right? coming up on the end of my junior year. And you were working as well, I believe you said, at Grandma's? Yes, my dad had recently closed his restaurant, and I think I got a part-time position there at Grandma's house. Okay. And was this how you were supporting yourself? Yes, it was. And uh, were you supporting Mr. Juarez as well? Um, not quite yet. Um, occasionally we'd go on a date, and I, of course, would pay for it, which wasn't a big deal to me at the time. Um, he had, um, an, he had a problem getting identification to prove that he was um, legally able to work in the United States. So um, he didn't have a uh, photo ID. He couldn't find a copy of his birth certificate. He didn't have a social security card, but he did have a social security number. Um, but every time he went to the DMV or the social security office or the courthouse, they wanted one form of identification that we were trying to get. So of those three, it was hard to get all of them. So he couldn't. That was the reason he couldn't work, or so. That was what I understood. Okay. So, based on what you told us earlier then, at the end of your junior year, you dropped out of high school and you began working full time to support yourself, right? Yes. Um, Bobby and I went to Chico, California briefly, which is um, near Sacramento. It's a little bit south, I think. Um, I was going to work there. I was going to live there. Um, it didn't work out. We were there for about uh, a week and um, we went back and so then I applied at a restaurant where I applied at Denny's actually um, and the woman there that gave me a good reference um, had worked for my dad the previous year um, her and her husband so um, I was hired there around I think August 2000 wait I'm sorry that would be 1998 and uh, at the, are you working full time? Um, yes, I am. Was. Okay. And is that the only job you had, or did you have another? I didn't. You know, I'm sorry. I forgot because in between that, I did have a brief job at this restaurant called the Purple Plum. I was a busser. Um, I worked there briefly before thinking I was going to move to Chico, and then I came back and began to work at Denny's. Now you've never been to America, have you? No. Right, okay. If we ever get over there, we've got about as much hope as, uh, of getting to America as we have of 
crapping diamond nuggets, haven't we? But if we ever do get over, I'm going to take you for breakfast at Denny's because Denny's is legendary. Denny's is brilliant. If you don't like a breakfast and debt from Denny's, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> so, working in Denny's, was this how you were supporting yourself and Mr. Juarez? Um, yes, that's that became our, our income. Were you making a lot of money? Um, well, the cost of living wasn't very high. I would, I would say no, but we were making ends meet because I didn't have rent or mortgage. Um, at that point, his parents had moved out and into um, a rest home. So we had the kind of run of the house and cleaned it up a little and, you know, discovered just things about the house that we didn't know about before because it was so cluttered. Well, who was, who was paying for the phone? Who was paying for the power? Um, not me. I don't know. I guess I really don't know. The phone was there. The power was there. Um, I think his parents were still paying for it. Okay. I don't know. Were you giving him, were you giving Bobby money to buy food or how was that? Yes, I went grocery shopping. I started buying him a few clothes. Um, at one point the power did shut off in the winter. The power was shut off? Yeah, we shut off briefly. So how did you get by? Were you able to get it turned back on? How did that um, We had a furnace and we used candles for a while. Um, it was very cold. Um, I don't remember how they got the power on, but Bobby had a friend or knew somebody that he had come over to the house and he tinkered with a meter on the side of the house and then we had power again. So. At this point in time, life doesn't seem like it was very ideal. No, but it was, I, I enjoyed the freedom. We just played it by ear. Um, I got moved to the graveyard shift at Denny's after some months there. And um, so we all became night owls, me and Bobby and all of our circle of friends that we socialized with. At this point in time, uh, how did Bobby treat you? Um, I thought he treated me well. Um, until I discovered that he wasn't being faithful. Okay. And when in your relationship did you discover that? Um, we had gone, he was on the party line a lot and he talked to this woman um, frequently. He said it, she, they were just friends. They had been interested in each other in the past, but they decided they were just friends. It made me a little uncomfortable. Um, he would talk to her a lot, actually, in my presence, so I figured he's doing it right in front of me. There's nothing going on there. Yeah, I think I understand why they're going so much into Jodie's past and these ex-boyfriends. Um, she's just mentioned that this Bobby guy was unfaithful to her and that Arius guy was a bit possessive. So basically, it's the poor Jodie show, isn't it? Yeah, it's, ne it's never her fault. No. It's always the other always person. Always somebody else's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah she's yeah. always completely without blame. Exactly. Um, so I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to, you know paint Jody as a victim and she's anything but I mean yeah she I will admit that I believe she's a victim of domestic abuse by, by her parents that's just my belief I whether it's as severe as I say as, it, as she said I don't know but I do believe she's a victim to that extent but we've all had failed relationships haven't we yeah. I mean, some of us have been cheated on, some of us have lost partners. Some of us have been hit. Yeah. You know, we've all had trauma with relationships, and it takes work to, you know, maintain a good relationship. Yeah, it does. So, you know, I'm not buying this victim thing. I'm not completely 100% she... buying it. He's not completely blameless in those breakups. No, I don't think so either. But she's trying to make us and the jury believe that she is. Um, so then one day he, um, we went to the library. That's where we went for our internet access. And he would email her a lot. And um, um, I took, I had to go to work at the Purple Plum. And um, I dropped him off at his friend's house. And... Um, I went to go to the Purple Plum, and before going to the Purple Plum, I went back to the library, and um, I clicked, this is, he had a Hotmail account, this is in 1998, so I clicked the, I don't know if they had different security things for Hotmail at that point, 
but I clicked the back button to see what was really going on with her because I had suspicions, and I found a whole bunch of love letters that he was writing her that were all contemporaneous with the time that we were together. So um, I printed them out, and I called in sick for work because I was not well emotionally, and um, I drove back out to his friend's house, and I didn't want to create a scene of drama, so I just said, can I talk to you? And so we went into the bathroom, and I pulled them out of my pocket and handed them to him, and he opened them up and read them, and I, I don't, he kind of felt, like, shocked. Hmm, seems she makes a habit of that, doesn't it? Yeah, she always seems to smile when she's talking about something that's traumatizing. Yeah, but I'm also getting at the fact that she's checking the internet of her partners if she did it with Bobby, she did it with Travis. She she she, she doesn't respect people's privacy, does she? I mean, even though she probably suspects that yeah, these but, you know these two guys are having an affair, she should just come out and say, "Are you cheating on me?" Yeah, but that's a bit possessive what she's doing. That is that is possessive behaviour. Yeah, but it's also an invasion of somebody's privacy. I mean, you know, you wouldn't dream of going through mine, and I wouldn't dream of going through yours because we trust each other. Exactly. Right? If one of us was suspecting the other one of having an affair, we'd confront each other. Exactly. We wouldn't go around checking phones and emails. Behind the back, yeah. So, once again, this seems to be recurring behaviour for her. Kind of glossed over it a little bit. When you saw these letters, how did it make you feel? Um, it didn't make me feel good. He was very um, loving and poetic with this person, and I could tell he had real feelings for her, and um, I don't know, I guess I felt jealous a little bit, but I, I, my heart was pounding. I just felt very deceived. Um, I forgot to mention one of the things I did before I went to the house is I drove back out to Montague, and I took all of my belongings out of his room and put them in my car, and... Um, decided I was going to move out and in with my grandmother. Um, so that's when I went back to his house and confronted him with those. Okay. I um, went back to the friend's house, sorry. You mentioned that he was, this, this woman, whoever it was that he was corresponding with, uh, that he was treating her in a very loving, poetic way. Yes. Um, it leads to the implication, anyway, that he wasn't that way to you. He was initially, but I don't know. I guess we had just sort of gotten comfortable around each other, and we weren't we weren't fighting or anything. We were just kind of I don't know. I don't really know how to explain it. He was still loving toward me, um, but he was. It seemed like he was going out of his way to really court her, whereas I was already, you know, in the bag, sort of, so to speak. You were already what was that? Just like I was already. He didn't have to court me. I was already with him. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Okay. So he is writing poetic Klingon love poetry to this other person, this other woman, right? But she hasn't explained why or why she suspected he was doing it. Was it something that she did? Was it something that she said? Was it her behavior? Was it that she was too clingy? Was it that he was getting tired of her? Who knows, but have you noticed how they ha she hasn't explained why um, he was sending this other woman all this poetic stuff? Yeah, but also, that ga these guys who she's mentioning, why weren't they called to testify? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, for all we know, they are, but I don't think so. She doesn't have many people standing up for her, certainly no family members. And no um, friends. Apart from Desiree and Daniel, I don't think there are any more friends. No, I think, that was it. I think the, the there's only if I think the only witnesses after Jody are um, psychologists and medical professionals. Yeah. So she can't even get somebody to stand up for her. But no, it's. I just wonder why these re this relationship with Bobby broke up. I don't think we'll even find out unless Martinez drills deeper into it. Yeah, if Martinez went deeper into it and found out we yeah might, we, might, we, we might know establishes the facts yeah was bobby ever physically abusive towards you um there was one time where we had a fight 
and oh, for fuck's sake, here we go again. I'm trying to think, I think this was in '99. Um, we had broken up and got back together a few times. I broke up with him obviously after that incident, and then he somehow I don't it's a long story, but he convinced me to stay, so I stayed and put all my things back. And um, prom he promised he wouldn't have contact with her anymore. But we broke up a few more times and then um, got back together. And at one point, I had moved out of his house and I was living with another woman. And um, it wasn't far from his house. It was like two blocks. Um, and in Montague, there's a lot of fields. It could actually, we could see each other's houses from there, um, sort of. And so, I was advised over and over to get away from him because he's not healthy. But um, you know, and my heart was—I was still—I still cared about him. So one day he came over to the house, like he always did, and we were hanging out. And I don't remember how, but an argument started. And um, objection, foundation, sustained. I don't know how, but an argument started. How very, very convenient. When was this? This was sometime in 1999, I think it was in the fall, early fall, like September, maybe even August, but I think it was around sometime in the early fall. Okay. And he was at the home? Did, was he physical with you at this, at this acquaintance's home? Um, yes, our argument escalated and he approached me and spun me around and he was very much into martial arts, so he had some kind of hold, I guess it was called a stranglehold. So he started strangling me, and um, just for a few seconds, and then he let go. I almost passed out, I fell on my knees, and um, it kind of made me upset, because <laughs> he'd never done that before. So I got up, he started walking away, I got up, and I said something to him like, um, what did I say, something to the effect of details about how they would die. And um, at that point, the argument escalated again, and he attacked me again, Not. I don't know how, he jumped on me, and at that point I was trying to get to the phone to call 911, and he got my arm in some kind of lock, and was putting pressure on the forearm, and I thought he might break it, because um, that seemed to be what the goal was. So I managed to grab the phone, and I called 911, and he grabbed it out of my hand and hung up, and I was crying, and he kept telling me to shut up, because they were going to call back. So he was right, they, the phone rang and he answered and um, he gave the operator an excuse, like said my girlfriend was trying to program my and went into the speed dial and accidentally called it. Do you believe a word of that? Not one bloody bit. That, that was pulled out of her marshmallow tree through her backside yeah. and into our consciousness now. Yeah, but have you noticed? First of all, she said she didn't know how, and then all of a sudden, oh, he jumped on me. Yeah, and she went into forensic detail about, you know, everything that he did, and he twisted her arm, and he did this, and he did that. Where's the report from the police that someone called in? I believe that happened about as much as I genuinely believe Bert and Ernie broke into Travis's house and murdered him. I think that's actually more likely to have happened than what she's just described. This happened, and then you got back together with him, right? Or you didn't really break up? This happened in. in this was really. I'm sorry. This was really toward the end of our relationship. We still. I don't. This was really toward the end. This was. It didn't happen. We didn't stay together much longer after that. But you did stay together after that, right? We continued to hang out. Um, he met a friend that he had known prior to. Um, his name was Matt, and he moved in with Matt. Um, and this was in Let me ask you this. Why did you stay together with him after this incident? Well, I don't know that we were still together together, but he would still come over to the house where I lived. And um, it was just a nicer place to hang out than his. And I just continued to hang out with him in that regard. Um, Why would you hang out with him in that regard? Um, well, the, the, the physical incident that occurred that day, the, those two things were isolated, and during all the years that I've known him, that had never happened before, so I just didn't think that it was something that had happened.
pattern of his or that would continue. And that's exactly why this story doesn't make sense. Because she's just told a story about, you know, this guy, you know, wailing the tar out of her. Yeah. And she still wants to hang out with him. Why would you want to hang out with someone who almost knocked, knocked you out? Whether it's a friend or a partner, the moment they lay hands on you... You go. You don't ever just hang out with them again as if nothing's happened. <laughs> that will forever be a blight on your relationship. You just go. Yeah. You just tip the hell out of there, don't you? Yeah. Did you ever engage in sexual behavior with him after this incident? I don't remember, maybe. Not very, maybe once or twice. I don't remember, honestly. And why was that okay with you after this incident? I still loved him. Eh, wrong answer. Your tuna fish still needed feeding. You mentioned point in time uh, when Bobby moved in with an individual named Matt. Yes. Okay. And I, I believe uh, you were talking about how at the end of your relationship with Bobby, uh, you moved into your grandparents' home, correct? Yes. Um, I moved out of that woman's house and into my grandmother's house. And what city is your grandmother's house located in? Why we go. And did you live there just with your grandmother or was anyone else living there? My grandfather also lived there and their dog, Ringo. Can I call tomorrow or? Um, were you close to your grandparents? Uh, how was your relationship with them? I felt close to my grandparents, not like lovey dovey close, but they seem they're very down to earth people. Well, my grandfather's. My grandmother is very down to earth, and I'm, I can just tell her anything, and it doesn't really faze her. Why didn't you move back in with your parents? Um, well, I didn't want to go back to that environment. We um, got along very well after I moved out, and I wanted to keep it that way. Okay. What, tell us about your life after you moved back to your grandparents' home. Are you? Are you still working at Denny's? Do you go back to school? Just kind of describe your life for us. Yes. Um, after that incident uh, occurred with Bobby, um, I had worked at Denny's for about a year at that point. And if you're a full-time employee at Denny's, or I think a minimum of like 32 hours a week, um, you get vacation benefits. And so I decided to um, use that time to spend away from him, and I flew back to Costa Rica for a week and a half. And am I correct in assuming that was to spend time with Victor? No. He didn't live in the house anymore. I stayed with my, the same family, but he had moved out and moved on. So you spent about a week and a half, it sounds like, um, with Victor's family, not with him. Yes. And kind of assessing your life, is that? Yeah, I spent a lot of time just reflecting and healing from that, and I felt in a lot better place by the time I came back. Victor actually, I did see Victor three days before I flew back. So he took me out to dinner and that was it. And then he drove me to the airport. When you say healing from that, what are you, what are you talking about? Healing from the relationship with Bobby? Yes, because we kept going back and I kept hearing about incidents where he was trying to hook up with other girls and but then he would deny it and I didn't see anything so I there was just a lot of turmoil. Um, we were arguing still, and then the, inc the physical incident that happened. There, and I needed to just remove myself from the situation so that I could allow my heart to move on a little. And so that break from him, I thought, had helped me a lot. So at some point in time, you were in love with Bobby, right? Yes, very much. A lot more than I was, Victor. Bobby was like my first true love. Okay. You're talking bullshit. So once you have spent some time in Costa Rica and you've, I guess, used your vacation time uh, at Denny's, you come back to Iruka, I presume? Yes, I did. And what, how do you, um, how do you proceed in your life? Um, I went back to work and I don't know if he was watching the restaurant, but the first day back I was there, I went into the back of the restaurant to get something and I came back out and he was sitting at the counter. He being who? Bobby. Okay. Um, 
he just had his face in his hands and he has he has really beautiful eyes and he was looking at me with these eyes these puppy dog eyes and um, I stopped and I was kind of shocked um, I felt stronger emotionally not as weak but um, I was coming up on my half hour break so I just I said just you know wait a few minutes and we'll go outside and talk so I went outside and um, we ended up talking for a long time. I mean, we rounded the corner and then hugged and it was emotional and that kind of thing. Okay. Why would you want to hug or even talk to someone who was abusive to you? It does not make sense. It doesn't? Why? Hardly anything she has said so far on the stand today has made sense. There's only one thing that's rung, rung true with me and that's the domestic abuse by her parents like i said i do believe she's telling some element of truth there but everything else i think is a load of crap but how did you was that the last time you see saw Bobby? Mm -hmm. okay. did you continue in a relationship with him after that we decided we were going to continue a relationship but just it didn't it, we weren't getting along very well and i use the word relationship are we talking about friendship or a Romantic relationship. Romantic. Um, did that mean also meet sexual? Uh, it would have meant that. I don't really remember, but yeah, it would have meant that. Okay. So why at this point in time were you still open to the idea of a romantic and potentially sexual relationship with a man who had choked you and thrown you down as you described? Well, like I said, I considered those incidents isolated and not a pattern of his, and I still loved him, and I, he, he still loved me, and I didn't want to hurt him, and I didn't want to, I don't know, it just, we were, we were, it just felt natural. I'd been with him for some years. He was my first love. Being with him, whether it was good or bad, it just felt natural, and it was what I was accustomed to. Okay. Right, you've got to wonder what this Bobby guy's opinion of all this is because you know did anybody after this trial track him down and kind of get his side of the story i would have liked to have heard his side of the story yeah because it appears to me as though she's slandering him here yeah and that's not good well no but then again she's got to try and make out to be the victim hasn't she yeah and let's face it she's got absolutely bugger all proof of any of this has she no so, at what point in time then do you decide, you said you and Bobby explored this and decided it wasn't for the best? When does is, when is that take place? Um, there was sort of a turning point in my mind. Well, Costa Rica was like a good starting point where I began, I thought I'd moved on. If I hadn't seen him again, I think I would have been okay as far as never seeing him again. Um, but I was weak when he came back and so he sort of picked up again briefly. He um, moved to Medford, Oregon shortly thereafter. It's about 50 miles north of Wairika. Um, and he moved in with Matt. And I would go up there and visit Bobby and we'd hang out. And it seemed like once Bobby got on his feet, he didn't really want anything to do with me. And so it, it, it hurt my feelings, I guess, because he had kind of won me back and I was helping him. But then when he got on his feet, he was kind of mean. Um, what do you mean you were helping him? Well, I always helped him out until he was able to get it. He finally got a job when he moved to Medford. Um, he met, there was a woman he knew that was a notary public that grew up with him in school, so she was able to say this is really who he is so he could get identification. We finally but figured that out. And so, Let me interrupt him. I want to make sure we're clear here. Even after the, the incident that what you were describing as a isolated incident of violence even after the point in time when you find him find letters uh, that are evidence that he's being unfaithful with you and you come back from Costa Rica you're going to move on you decided a romantic relationship isn't going to work are we to understand that you're still supporting him financially as well um, or helping him? That was a, a little bit out of order, but I did continue to help him. Um, when I found out about the love letters, he promised to cut ties with her and not have any contact with her anymore. And it was, wasn't physical, it was online only. She lived in Louisiana. And um, he, I think he was still talking to her, but he promised me 
you'll never have to see me talking to her. So it was implied that he might talk to her, but he'll never do it in my presence. So it was kind of strange. But, um, and then again, the physical incident was isolated. So, you know, if he needed clothing, I would, I didn't like buy him a whole wardrobe. I didn't have that kind of income. But if he needed a few shirts or something, um, he was really into South Park, so he saw these South Park t-shirts one time and he wanted those, so I bought them sweatshirt, um, jeans, that kind of thing. Just some kind of clothing for him because his parents weren't able to provide that at that point. They were in a rest home. Okay. Okay, we're coming towards the end of this day's testimony. Since she took the stand, I've not just been listening to what she's been saying. I've been observing her and I've been watching her. And one thing that I am in no doubt of is that she is enjoying every single second of this on the stand. Well, now she, it's like she's in the spotlight. It's the Jodie Arias show. And now she's going to make the it host, hers. And she is going to talk about her favourite subject, herself. Exactly. Because it's all about her. She's the victim. It's, yeah. no, it's everyone else's fault, not hers. Nermi may ask her some slightly probing questions while she's on the stand, and indeed Wilmot may do the same. But I don't think right now she is prepared for the barrage and the onslaught that will be Juan Martinez's cross. Oh yeah, I can't wait for that. That is going to hit her like a sledgehammer in the doohickeys, I tell you. It will. And you said at this point in time, uh, Bobby was living in Medford, Oregon with an individual named Matt, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, just so we can get a, a sense of where this is compared to Wairika, could you describe for us where Medford is compared to Wairika? Yes, it's on Interstate 5, just like Wairika. Um, it's over the border. It's about an hour drive, I think 50 miles, but it takes about an hour to get there depending on traffic Okay. and the weather. And Certainly not asking for population estimates, but is this a bigger town than Wairika? It's a bigger town, not nearly as big as um, this area. It's very tiny in comparison, but it's much bigger than Wairika. And you made trips up to Medford to see Bobby, is that right? Yes, I would come up there on the weekend and stay. Um, Bobby had a futon. Um, they had kind of a studio, so Matt slept in his own bed, and Bobby and I had a futon, and I would just we would hang out on the weekends and go out and do things. Okay. And uh, how many of these trips can you say? I mean, was this was this something you did every weekend? Uh, how frequently did you go up to spend time with, with Bobby? Um, I've been up several times, but that period of our relationship was short-lived. So it was that didn't happen often. I mean, very extensively. Okay. And uh, this person, Matt, uh, that he was roommates with. Had you known Matt prior to these trips up to Medford? No. Okay. And does Matt have a last name? McCartney. Did you ever develop any sort of friendship or relationship with him? Yes, um, we became friends um, around the time. I think he kind of noticed how Bobby was treating me and it felt good to have somebody else kind of see my side of it. Um, he wasn't attacking Bobby by any means, like saying, hey, you should be this way or that. Um, but it just, you know, I actually, I came up there one weekend to visit and another girl came to visit Matt and it was a real eye-opener because I saw how Matt was treating her and he was very chivalrous and very polite and he was a gentleman and he just treated her with a lot of respect and that's not something I had received, but you know, I've seen it on TV and that kind of thing. So it was just jarring to see that and then see and then consider my relationship. So um, but let me let me ask you this. You said that that was surprising for you to see, right? Yes. Um, and that is in a way that you experienced Bobby treating you. Is that right? No. Yes, that's right. But you lived with your parents for 17 years, the first 17 years of your life, right? Yes. Did you not see your father treat your mother in this way? Did, did they treat each other in a different manner? Um, when I was young, my father was very affectionate with my mom. 
I've seen them kiss, I've seen them embrace. Um, if there's a beautiful woman on TV and while sitting there watching it, he'll say she's not as pretty as your mom. Or, you know, he, he put her on sort of a pedestal, sort of. Um, but then there were times when they would argue and fight, things like that. You say argue and fight. What does that mean? Um, not physical. They would just, well, sometimes. I mean, he would say something. My dad's very sarcastic, and he thinks he's funny. And sometimes he is. Um, but he can be very uncouth sometimes. And so when things would come out of his mouth, my mom would just smack him on the arm. And um, he would smack her back, kind of as a way to say, don't do that. And then she would be offended by that, so she would smack him back. And then he'd smack her even harder. And then she would give up. But it was just on the arm. But, you know, that's the only time I ever saw them be physical at all. Something about that doesn't make sense to me either and doesn't ring true and I'll tell you why from personal experience I said earlier on in this video that I grew up amidst a lot of violence um, per perpetrated on me and my brothers um, it also followed that my parents were very violent with each other as well as being violent with us now what she's just described there she's almost described them play fighting little chucks on the arm and and you know stuff like that it sounds almost horseplay, doesn't it? Yeah, you would think that if these people were as violent as she claims they are, yeah. especially to them, yeah. they would be that e excessive violent with, with each, each other. other. Yeah. Well, let's face it, at the end of the day, Jodie and her sister's brothers, they are those two people's blood. Why would they hurt them and not each other? It wouldn't stand to reason. It, it just doesn't make. It just doesn't really ring true to me. I don't know about you guys listening, watching to the, watching this. Let me know if if you think it rings true to you. Did you know? Uh, how did your fa father treat your mother? Was he degrading to her? Did he criticize her? Um, I can't recall specific incidents, but that's very much my dad. He's very negative. He's very critical. Um, he's very gossipy. Um, Wait, what was that? I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> gossipy. He gossips a lot about okay. people behind their back. He talks about them. Um, so, I mean, he'll say things about, now we talk on the phone now, and he'll say things about my mom sometimes, or sometimes they have complaints about each other, but, you know, they're still loyal to each other. God, he sounds a right charmer, doesn't he? He certainly does. Yeah, just the sort of guy to share a warm, tender moment with. Well, what do you mean things he would say about your mom? What, com what things would he complain about with your mother? Um, Close to my Approach. You may continue. Without telling you specifically what he said, was there certain subject matters that your dad would degrade your mother regarding? Um, one I recall specifically is um, my mother used to be very thin, and I think she's like a size 10 now, I would guess. Um, he used to put up photos of her on the refrigerator when she was thinner, and um, he would make comments about her weight gain. Um, and just, he would put little things like that around the house to remind her that he would prefer her with less weight, things like that. So I don't know how that affected her, but um, that was pretty constant. If somebody was crossing the crosswalk that was overweight, he would yell at them, and I won't say what he said, but um, I don't know, things like that. Okay. Where does Jody find these guys? I mean, her dad yells at fat people on the crosswalk, and then Travis, bless him, you know, bless his soul, but he didn't like the words crap, poop, and fart. Where did she... Why did she surround herself with these men? I you know don't know. I mean? it's, it's just weird to me, that's all. It's just probably the kind of guys she attracts. I know, yeah. For all we know, um, Ryan didn't like the smell of bloody cabbage. But you said your mother would just simply... You said you, something to the effect um, you learned... A, they were always loyal to each other. Yes. Your mom was always loyal to your dad. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Um. Well, my parents weren't the kind where if one said no, you couldn't run to the other and have a different answer. Maybe if they didn't weren't aware of the other 
of their spouses answer, but um, they were very united. Um, if we were fighting, it didn't matter the points of the argument. My dad would side with my mom, or my mom would side with my dad at all times. So um, they were very, they were like one unit. They were very united. They were very loyal. And it, I think when I was younger, I heard my, I think I heard my mom mention the word divorce one time, but, and that really like shook me because I thought it just didn't seem, I couldn't imagine a world where my parents weren't married. Um, and so they're still married today. I mean, even through bad times, they've, they're still together. They still love each other. Well, I, I should have been more clear in my question. You, you know, you talked about loyalty uh, as parents and, and backing each other up and that sort of thing. But what I was really asking about is in terms of the, the loyalty of the, re, of the relationship. Sounds like from what you're telling us, uh, your mom put up with a fair amount and remain loyal to your dad. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. Um, yeah. They're very loyal. They're still married. They've been married about 33 and a half years. My right. grandparents are married. There's not a very high divorce rate in my family. So they're still together. Okay. Um. The rate of murderers in the family has gone up by one, though, hasn't it? We were talking about this uh, different way uh, Matt McCartney was treating um, a, a female, I guess it was his girlfriend or someone he was dating, is that correct? I think it's somebody he had met online or somehow, she lived in Crescent City, um, and she just came out for the weekend the same time I came out to see Bobby, and nothing ever really progressed with that. They didn't start dating or anything like that. Um, they just hung out for the weekend and I just saw how he was treating her. Okay. Tell me how things then um, progressed in your life. Did you just keep working? Did your life change at all? Um, I wanted to. Um, I wanted to work in a in an environment where I could earn a little bit more money. Um, I needed a new car. Um, there were different kinds of bills coming in at this point. Um, and Medford is a town that has a lot more restaurants, a lot more business, that kind of thing. So um, as I got to know Matt and Bobby, um, Matt's mother lives in Wairika too, so I met her and his sister, and we all sort of became friends. And Matt's dad lived in a city called Phoenix. It's in um, just south of Medford, and it's in Oregon. And um, he, had, he lived with his girlfriend, Matt's dad, and they had an extra... Well, they said, just come crash on the couch until you can get a job and get your own place. So I crashed on Matt's dad's couch where he and his girlfriend lived for, I don't remember how long, maybe a month. And I got a job at Applebee's and began to work there. Okay. So did you then move to Medford, move out of your grandparents' house and move to Medford? Just tell us about that. Yes. Um, right around the time I moved to Medford, um, Bobby and I stopped talking. Um, he actually, I was hanging out with him and his sister and um, her son, um, and they were renting a house right across the street from my parents' house. So I was over there hanging out with them, and Bobby came by and saw um, Matt and I and Kiowa, who was her, his sister's, his nephew. We were all in the front yard. And we were playing with... Um, they're called bokens, and they're just wooden swords just to practice form and things like that. And uh, Matt was into martial arts also. Um, so he was teaching me some things and teaching Kiowa some things, and Bobby came around the corner and saw us all like in formation or just hanging out and having fun, and he got really upset, and he walked away. And um, I think Matt tried to talk to him. He didn't want to talk to either of us. And at that point, things were just really stopped between Bobby and I. Um, we stopped talking. We stopped communicating. I think he moved out of Matt's studio, and I didn't see or hear from him again. Okay. Bobby, if you're watching, if you're listening, you had a very lucky escape. Where were you? You mentioned uh, crashing on Matt's father's couch. Yes. Right. And he, Matt's father had a girlfriend that he lived with in this home. Yes. Okay. Um, once you got a job and got settled um, in uh, Medford, where did you wind up living? Um, about, let's see, 
After Bobby and I stopped talking, Matt and I began to hang out more, and we developed feelings for each other. And so about a month, maybe five weeks went by, and um, Matt moved out of his studio apartment and got an apartment. And um, at that point, um, I went to live with him there, and I moved out of his dad's house, and we rented um, a one-bedroom apartment in Medford. And when was this? I would much? say at this point it was early 2000, I think. Okay, and at this point in time, Matt McCartney is your boyfriend? Yes. At the, well, I don't remember us making it official, but we became romantic, and then it, yeah, we were boyfriend-girlfriend. Okay. Judge, this might be a good time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow morning, 10.30, please remember the admonition. Have a nice evening. You are excused. Please stand for the Shit house. Please be seated. Council, anything before we adjourn for the day? All right. Have a nice evening. You may step down.